Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, a program dedicated to exploring the contributions of archaeologists in the Middle East to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark. I direct the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University in Riverside, California, and I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Kent Bramlett, who is an associate professor of archaeology and the history of antiquity at La Sierra and one of the associate directors of the center as well. We have been working our way through New Testament books. Our specialties are Old Testament, but we're Christians, and so we read the New Testament. We both can read Greek. And, and we both can read and teach Greek, and That's so right. we've paid attention to texts and manuscripts and inscriptions, all of which are part of this world we're talking about in, in the book of Acts. We talked in our last episode about the part of the Book of Acts that happens in the Eastern Mediterranean. So we're talking about the Palestinian coast, we're talking about up into Syria, going down to, uh, through Israel, past Gaza, and so on. Now we turn our attention to the Northern Mediterranean, and we want to think about, basically, about Paul's journeys. And so we want to explore these places. We want to explore people, we want to explore artifacts, inscriptions, and so on. You have talked before about this book of Acts and this explosion of witness of Christianity. Talk to us some more about that. Well, it's really amazing how the network in the Roman Empire facilitates the spread of Christianity in these early years. It's uh, a matter of meeting people, People spread out, they go home, different places. Paul's first journey is probably thrown off course by one of his early converts. We'll talk about this. But he was probably headed in an entirely different direction to North Africa, and he ends up then going to Asia Minor. And this is where his life then uh, develops, his three missionary journeys. So again, it's these interactions with people, uh, both early Christians going out into the world, especially Paul, and then those that they meet and who become followers of the way, or early Christians, then continue to spread the and word. They're called the way several times in the book of Acts. They are, until at Antioch, finally, the, the Christian is termed, uh, becomes a term for these new people. Exactly. This first first time they're first called time. Christians, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the, the whole idea of travel, of trade, of cultural interchange happens because of this term? This, right, the interconnectedness of the Roman Empire. And uh, it's, the time is ripe for something like this to happen, both in the larger developments of uh, philosophy at the time. They're sort of backing away within the, the classical Roman religions of um, this belief in the Greek mythologies and stuff. They're looking for many people for a more personal relationship with deity, for a personal salvation. Um, Christianity really speaks to that need, and also we have then this uh, ease of movement across the Mediterranean world. Which could not have happened, what, a few centuries before? Too it, many conflicts? It, we had empires, but not the same sort of access? It would be highly unlikely for something to spread as readily and as, right, as right, quickly. Right. Okay. Well, we want to turn to the book of Acts. We'll do that after we look at some artifacts on the table in front of us. So if you will take the ceramics, you take the clay ones, and then I'll take metal and glass. I'll take the feet of clay. <laughs> feet of clay. Okay. <laughs> sure. We have some small vessels over here, and oftentimes small vessels can give us a clue, again, to trade, because small vessels, especially the ones that are closed, that is, they have a very small opening rather than flaring open, more like a serving vessel. But these small closed vessels would contain something very precious, very valuable. And in the case of these little um, vessels, probably perfumes, scented oils, unguents. We do know they're also bringing in spices from quite far away. So there could be some really rare spices that come in in something like this. But trace analysis in modern excavations, if you pull a vessel like this out of the excavation layer that you're working with, you, would, you wouldn't wash it, you wouldn't clean it, you would save it and then do uh, trace analysis on the interior. And in this way, we found traces, not we personally, but archaeologists have found traces of cinnamon, of, of some of far distant uh, trade. Now, can you also do analysis on the clay to find out where it perhaps could have come from? 
um, with, with some degree of, of um, definition to the geographical areas, um, we can. If clay sources have been sampled and characterized by the elements, especially the sort of the extra elements that just happen to be in mixed in the clay, there are characteristics. We can say this is clay from, uh, from Cyprus or from parts of different locations in Turkey or wherever. So sure, um, we can analyze the clay, do a neutron activation analysis of it, and we could say this is probably, was probably manufactured in a given location. Okay, good. Lamps continue to be important uh, through Paul's um, journeys, uh, this, this time period. Again, Roman uh, period, Hellenistic Roman and Jewish style lamps are all part of the larger cultural picture mm -hmm. illuminated by these vessels. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we have some more ceramic artifacts here. Again, larger vessels, cooking vessels, uh, vessels very utilitarian, but also indicative of what society is experiencing and, and living. So we, we have examples that um, Paul would certainly be familiar with in his journeys. And the cooking pot here, but this is more, what, a storage jar? A small storage jar. Mm -hmm. And the cooking pot. Sometimes on, on shipwrecks, we actually find a, a couple, not the hundreds of big storage jars that are the cargo, but actually what the sailors were using. And so um, think of a small fire up on the, the ship deck, you know, and, and contained, they're Contained, we hope. <laughs> hopefully well contained, <laughs> and they're cooking their meals. Right. Well, and then we have some smaller artifacts in front uh, from the center of the table, moving to, to our right, but to viewers left. Um, a mirror. The Romans were famous for their cosmetics and their taking care of themselves and their appearance. Uh, and so we have mirrors for people to make sure that they're putting the eyeshadow in the right place. Right, and in its original condition of highly polished bronze, it would, it would have functioned quite That's nicely. Right. And then glass, we have several glass um, bottles here, Roman glass. Um, all of the, well, the glass and the necklaces that we'll look at in a moment, all from the collection of uh, Audrey Schaefer. Actually, these are from uh, the center. And then the jewelry and a couple of lamps over here are from uh, Audrey Schaefer of Corona. And Christina Reed, I must give her credit, we must give her credit mm -hmm. for putting our um, collections together that we use on the, on the program. So we have then on my far right some jewelry, some necklaces uh, made of beads. These are Roman. Uh, these are, were found in different settings and then strung together with modern string. And some, I don't know, are they earrings or are they small bracelets or bangles of some kind? You they would be a very call. small person, so. Okay, with that in mind then, let's turn again to the book of Acts. So we have two episodes of this program on Acts. The first one, we looked at Acts as it unfolds in the Eastern Mediterranean, basically Palestine and Syria, we could go to the north. Uh, but now we want to turn to the Northern Mediterranean. We've seen this map a lot, but I don't know that we can understand the New Testament world without this larger overlay of the Roman Empire. Right, I think we can't. I mean, to see that the Roman Empire goes all the way from Egypt to Hadrian's Wall in Britain, uh, and that the same sorts of architecture and Roman culture are, are implanted in the local societies, I think it illustrates well that sort of new world order that uh, developed under the Roman administration. If we could think of the whole earth, we could think of globalism. But this is probably as close as anybody could get, at least at the time. You could, so. um, right, until we, well, we get Genghis Khan and <laughs> some bigger ones later. But yes, this was unprecedented right. up to that point. And surrounding the Mediterranean, surrounding that, that whole economic powerhouse of the Mediterranean and the trade that could a develop. Huge amount of economic yeah. power and leverage available the, in that region. The Romans? it seems, in Roman cities, and we'll see it again. The, 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 the typical features of a Roman city, the theater, the nymphaeum, showed wealth and power, right? They demonstrated the uh, prowess. They the did, world. and the Romans could, uh, conceived of their mission as a civilizing force. They were bringing you know, flowing water and baths and, 
things which were basically unknown at that time in many of the parts that they conquered. And so, yes, from their perspective, they were not only conquering, they were civilizing these regions. And sometimes even to a level of being ostentatious. I mean, so much water flowing brought in by these aqueducts from sometimes 20, 30 miles away. So you have the wealth to do that. And so you have the power. And so mm -hmm. look upon your, your emperor with favor. Right, and many Pay of these taxes. buildings were dedicated to, yes. if not the emperor, at least to local uh, important uh, officials or sponsored by them. But again, the power is projected through these monuments okay. and constructions. Right. Well, then let's take a, a, a look at the emperors who did play this role of keeping the Pax Romana, the peace of the Roman Empire. Um, we can see them listed here all the way from 14 AD through 68. And the book of Acts picks up toward the end of the first one. But in any case, these are the ones, the highlighted ones. Um, now, we actually do have busts of these four. And I think you've talked before about how at least the attempt of the artist was to be realistic. Yeah, it was. These are, um, we have verbal descriptions from some of the Romans like Suetonius. He describes, he goes through and gives a visual description and then talks about their character and about their achievements. and foibles and so forth. With Tiberius, uh, Augustus, when he appointed him, wasn't really thrilled with him, but he'd run out of other options. They died or whatever. And Tiberius is rather dour, but he was quite effective. And um, we think that this is indeed what he looked like. And then if we go to Caligula, who does not have a positive reputation. You know, Caligula um, fell to the vices, shall we say. Um, he, was, he was not the, the best example of Roman emperor. No or culture. And Claudius, with an interesting hair, uh, quaffed interestingly here. And uh, all of these were, were friends with, with um, Agrippa when he was young, Agrippa II. And um, so he sort of flowed in this circle of, of um, very important individuals, two and of then, which became emperors. R right. And then the one toward the end of the Book of Acts and of the life of Paul is Nero. Yeah, and we, we just have to regret the fact that when Paul called his case to take it before the emperor, as was his right, unfortunately, the emperor was Nero. Nero was not well suited to be an emperor. Uh, his mother, a very strong woman, had gotten him the position through various maneuverings. But Nero didn't really know how to, uh, to fulfill that position. He projected tremendous amounts of ostentation but he did it to an extreme to where it sort of alienated those that should have been uh, drawn to it. So he was a populist, by the way. The, local, the commoners loved him. He built these great things and invited them into parties. And, and his reputation lived on for quite a while among the common folk. Fact is, he kept reappearing after his death, like Elvis. So you know, people would see him here or there. Yeah. Um, but as far as the, among the aristocracy, they hated him. And probably more widely in the empire not well respected. Not an effective ruler. So again, um, didn't make wise decisions. Right, 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 right. Well, then let's look at the book of Acts. Um, the, the book of Acts, as we've talked about it before, begins with kind of collecting um, the, the disciples and friends and associates kind of collecting themselves following the death and resurrection of Jesus. But it doesn't take long before they then begin to expand. And first locally in the Eastern Mediterranean, and then as this part of the outline shows, the highlighted in yellow, going empire-wide. So this is, I, I mean, this is a terrific outline. And it's a terrific book and a terrific sense of explosion and growth um, in Christianity throughout the Mediterranean world, which ultimately then, it takes a couple centuries, becomes the Roman the official Roman Empire religion, Christianity. Does. Right, and that's an amazing transformation that this, this new fringe movement on the fringe of established religions and cultures should rise to become the, the accepted, authorized religion of the Roman Empire. Right, right. So we will be walking our way through. Uh, even the journeys, we'll be looking at those, at least via the map. Some inscriptions. We do have inscriptions. Archaeologists love inscriptions, and there are lots of them from the Roman period. 
some graffiti um, we will look at from Rome. We'll take a, a look at some of those, and then three of them here will we'll, we'll actually examine each of those inscriptions and think about them together. Jewish on the left, Christian on the right. What do you see in these symbols? Yeah, the menorah, the seven-branched lampstand is one of the primary Jewish symbols. It appears on everything from clay lamps to tombstones. It looks like something in the lower right-hand corner of that image, right next to the uh, candelabra. I don't know what that is. I'm sure the art historians would uh, be able to help us. But then if we move to the Christian, what do we have here? Several uh, symbols, which again carry a lot of uh, a wealth of uh, semantic information. The alpha, of course, the A, alpha, the alpha and omega. Uh, the Cairo or Hiro symbol, which is a, a superposition of the first two letters for the name of Christ in Greek. And a, a chalice, perhaps. And the dove, symbol of peace with the olive branch. Uh, these are all symbols that occur in, on Christian uh, tombs, in the catacombs, various locations like that. Put on there by family members um, to remember the religion of uh, those, their, their family that they're burying, yeah. and to keep that whole flame alive. That's right. In the process. OK, another kind of inscription uh, carved in stone. Who is this person? Sergius or Sergius Paulus was the governor in the area of Cyprus, and he'd come. His hometown originally was was Pisidian Antioch up in Asia Minor, but um, Paul meets him in Paphos on on uh, Cyprus, the eastern side of Cyprus, western side of Cyprus, and becomes an early convert. And in fact, is it's probably this encounter and conversion that redirects Paul's. Uh, mission that port city there looks like it was a uh, stopping off point for ships headed to North Africa. Was Paul going to, you know, Cyrene? Think of Simon of Cyrene from that area, or further over Leptis Magna, or one of the other great cities, Roman cities. He may well have been going that direction, but this reroutes him then into Asia Minor, where he spends the the, um, the entirety of that of that first journey. It was nice to have his name, especially with the encounter with Paul inscribed in stone. Right, again, to, to see a contemporary inscription with the name of the same individual mentioned in the biblical story. And, and we'll see something similar with this inscription found in Delphi. You can currently see this in the museum in Delphi. This is in Greece. And this is another leader, political leader. Gallio. Yeah, the proconsul of that Actually, area. A large of, area. Uh, pretty large. Right. And he's important because he's the one that acquits Paul or refuses to take the case, at least, when Paul is accused in Corinth um, by this rabble, really, this, uh, in the individuals that he's offended, uh, and they wish to have Paul tried. And Galileo says, oh, this is a religious dispute. Yeah. You know, go settle it. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to pursue it. Right. And then a third one, a person mentioned in the book of Acts. He is mentioned, and he's mentioned as being in a position of sort of the, the exchequer, the uh, finance uh, um, the CFO, uh, CFO for, <laughs> right, for the, for the city. Um, and his name occurs in the stone inscription. So here we have, again, a, a, a clear connection with a, a figure that is of some importance, really, in Paul's ministry. All three of them. All three of them. And these find them all represented in inscriptions that we now have which probably suggests there are lots of others that we don't have. Probably. Maybe as archaeologists continue their work, we'll find some more. We'll try. It will hold. So, Although you and I don't typically work in the Roman period or in the right place. But <laughs> right. We'll, but we'll, be, we'll try. <laughs> we'll, we'll be rooting everybody else along. We would like along. to find something. An interesting component of the Mediterranean world has to do with the Murex shell and the purple dye. And in a moment, we'll look at shipwrecks, too. But first of all, murex. So what is it about these little critters found by the millions in the Mediterranean that is important to people who make clothing? Well, these little critters are <laughs> carnivorous <laughs> snails, I guess you could almost call them, in the, um, the Mediterranean saltwater. But they have a little gland, and that gland can be processed to produce a, a dye primarily a purple dye. 
um, and through a very complex um, production system in which there's oxidation, there's a whole pro chemical process that's quite complicated. Uh, it produces this beautiful purple that was highly sought after in the ancient world. So expensive that only royalty generally could afford it. The hypobronchial The hypobronchial Okay, gland. Christina made sure to look that up and let me know that information. She also told me that it takes uh, about a gram of this material when it's dried to, uh, to utilize, to, to make a garment, to, to, to dye a garment. And it takes about 10,000 of these shells to come up with that. So we're talking about um, elite. We're talking about people who could, only people who could afford. And the Phoenicians had made their name through this. Literally, the, probably their name is derived from the word for purple in, in the ancient Phoenician. And the, the area continues, Eastern Mediterranean continues to produce this in certain localities. Uh, we have Lydia, right, in the Book of Acts, named as a, as a, a dyer of, of purple cloth. So it was in, somehow it was in this uh, industry, which means she must have had good contacts. She must now, have. It's not always that the people producing the goods for the elite have any kind of real connections with the elite. But she may have. I mean, this may have been a, a wealthy person. It was certainly a, a specialty um, trade. Students who have done experimental archaeology with the Mirek shells have gone through the process, have tried to follow ancient uh, practices as spelled out in literature, and have collected all of these things, killed them, taken their glands, done all that they need to do to them. Um, and evidently, it raises quite a stench. So much so that at least some students were told by the villagers where they were doing this, which was right on the coast, to move inland, to move away somewhere else because it stink, it, 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 the stench was so bad that they had to move. So this is a process that wasn't just a clean sort of thing. It was something that people had to do and had to put up with. I just wonder how they first discovered that this, um, <laughs> this snail could make the purple. One has to wonder. You know, I understand that, in fact, I've seen pictures when the snail is on your hand, they can actually squirt some of that out so you see the purple. Mm -hmm. And so it's not something you have to wait for the animal to die. You can actually see it come out in your hand. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's Probably. how they spotted it mm -hmm. and saw that it stuck to their hand because it's, it's pretty strong. Mm -hmm. Stays with us. Okay, here is a pile of those Mirek shells. I mean, millions of these things, especially when it takes 10,000 to make enough for one garment. And here are some indications of the dyeing, uh, the results of dyeing. And then if we put, want to put it on garments, these are fairly good illustrations of the types of garments Roman men and Roman women would wear. So quite lengthy and quite, you know, you'd be throwing it over different parts, your mm -hmm. shoulder and so on. But here's what you needed the 10,000 Murex shells to produce uh, purple dye for. Another important part of the book of Acts, especially as we think about the end of Acts, is Paul's rides on, uh, on ships. I mean, he's going across the Mediterranean a lot, especially the last ride. He is shipwrecked. Oh, he's shipwrecked too, as well on another one. He but is, in, yeah. He but is. in any case, probably a merchant ship, something like this. The, uh, the, the large um, grain ship, wasn't it, going to, to Rome, I think, that he rode on? This is interesting. You can only see the bottom of the hole because the, the part this was originally covered by the sand, and the part that was exposed was eaten away by worms yes. and other uh, sea creatures. Right. But this part was preserved. So we have you can see there the storage jars that are laid out it, still resting in the hole, right. and this was what was salvaged right. from this right. wreck. And this from about the third century BC, but we're assuming that this, especially with the vessels uh, and the cargo, it would be very similar. This is in the northern part of Cyprus on the Turkish side, and um, in a very nice museum, actually, uh, the Kyrenia shipwreck. And this is a cutaway of what that might have looked like as the amphora were put in there. And they could be nested, um, put a little straw in between, put another layer on, they'd fit like eggs. Yeah. Well, we have some um, journeys that we have to think about, and so we'll look at some maps, and then we'll look at a couple of sites. We'll visit them. This one being the first journey, and one can see a trip down to Cyprus, and then up to Antioch in Pisidia, 
we will, um, actually he's there quite a bit, and right. <clears throat> then we have other places in um, what would, we would think about as Turkey and Asia Minor. The second one, much more expansive, going all the way to, um, to Macedonia and stopping at different places, including some that we think about with Ephesus in particular. Uh, Ephesus and, Ath and Athens, or Corinth, excuse me, are where he spent much of that time. Right. And then the third trip, also long, covering some of the same territory. And then the trip to, um, to Rome, um, going more south and avoiding the, uh, at least the places where he made landfall earlier. And then if you want to put them all together on a map, Paul was busy. Yeah, it looks uh, like the, he was quite an itinerary. And again, could do this in part because of Pax Romana and because of the empire and the arrangements then. Well, the largest synagogue evidently around the Mediterranean at the time was this one at Sardis, which is one of the churches in the, well, mentioned in one of the, uh, one, as one of the seven churches in Revelation, but this is a synagogue at that site. And it's a very large and is beautiful. It has been restored and protected uh, extremely well. It's a great place to visit. <coughs> then if we go to Antioch, we were just talking about it, of, I say Pisidia. Do you do it the same? I do Pisidia first, so Pisidian Antioch. Okay. That's how I say okay. it. So theater, mm -hmm. Romans were there, so they built a theater. Um, they also had temples, and so we have this temple to Augustus. <clears throat> and an arched, this may have been a, um, uh, an aqueduct. Looks like it would have supported It certainly looks like um, the, the Roman aqueducts that they built. Lystra, another site of importance in the journeys. Uh, excavations going on uh, on this site. Philippi, we have a book coming out of this place, or at least addressed to the people of this place, the Philippians. Thessaloniki, a marketplace. These are all over the place, too. I mean, you think about the theaters and the nymphaeum and so, and so on, but the marketplaces that the Romans built around the cardos, the main street. Right, on each uh, flanking the cardos. Right, right, right. Uh, another one here with a covered cardo, uh, but now with the shops sitting alongside of it. At least it was once covered. Athens, you know well, you've spent some time teaching there. I have too, and it's been fun. It's important, and important for uh, Paul's travels. And of course, this place. The Areopagus. So where, what happens here? Well, this is where Paul debates with other philosophers, or locals, and he uh, proposes to show them, tell them about the unknown God. And so this is a very important dialogue that Paul has, trying to reach people where they are uh, through methods that, that um, would resonate with them. And when you take students to here, do they go, first of all, to the Acropolis, or do they go to the Areopagus because of Paul? It's fun to clamber over the Areopagus. It is, it is. Make that direct and, and connection. And we know that's where he did this. We do. Good. Thank you, Kent, and thank all of you for joining us for this episode of Excavating the Bible. We hope this has provided something for you to think about and to increase your faith. And we look forward till next time. Until then, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring.